Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you tonight to our two guest speakers. Actually, it's going to be a dialogue. So um, we've got a set of questions for them, and we expect you all to ask questions as well. Um, I also don't have the flyer, so I don't know what we named this session either. <laughs> the view from the clerks. <laughs> I'm sorry. We were just talking about nobody having the flyer. Um, this is called The View from the Clerks, uh, and the clerks meaning uh, two law clerks to the Supreme Court at the time in 1954. Uh, so you're getting a really unique view that you don't have a lot of people to talk about this. So we hope you appreciate that. I'm going to introduce um, our guests one at a time, and then they will come up and sit in the middle. And then uh, Dr. Mirpal and I will be asking them questions back and forth, and I didn't introduce myself either. So I'm Professor Jessica Gordon Nemhard in Africana Studies and one of the co-teachers, and my colleague Dr. Michael Mirpal is the other co-teacher. So welcome. Uh, Ernest Rubenstein has spent uh, almost 43 years practicing law at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison in New York City engaged in a diverse practice that included public and privately owned business enterprises, nonprofit organizations, families, and individuals. During that period, he was actively involved as a trustee and officer of several social service and educational nonprofit organizations. He retired from Paul Weiss in 1997 and is of counsel to the firm. From 1998 through 2011, Mr. Rubenstein served as a managing director and a member of the board of directors of Carl Marx and Company Incorporated, a privately owned New York City investment and financial services form, firm. Sorry. He also continued to serve on the board until two, oh, since 2011. He serves on the board of directors as an officer of two private foundations, the Stella and Charles Gutman Foundation Incorporated and the Samuel and Anna Jacobs Foundation Incorporated. He's also on the board of the Yale Law School Fund, ex officio. Mr. Rubenstein served as editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal from 1952 to 53, was elected to the order of the Cuff Coif. Upon graduation from Yale Law School in 1953, then served as law clerk for Justice Tom C. Clark of the United States Supreme Court from 1953 to 54. He received his A.B. degree cum laude from Princeton in 1950, and his concentration was at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. So I now bring you Ernest Rubenstein. And our second guest is Raymond S. Traub. Traub. <laughs> Sorry about that. A financial consultant in New York City, he's been a non-executive director uh, of more than 25 public corporations. He has lectured extensively on corporate governance and on the duties and responsibilities of directors of public companies. He has served as chairman of the Compensation Audit and Finance Committee of a number of boards of directors. Mr. Traub served as the law clerk to Mr. Justice Harold H. Burton of the United States Supreme Court and to Chief Judge Thomas W. Swan in the United States Court of Appeals Second Circuit and was an associate of Sullivan and Cromwell and a partner of Lazard Frayers and Company specializing in mergers and acquisitions. He was named a director of Enron Corp. in November 2001 and subsequently served as a non-executive chairman until Enron's emergence from bankruptcy in November 2004. He is presently a member of the boards of directors of the Diamond Offshore Drilling, General American Investors, Gentiva Health Services, and the Wendy's Company. Certain of his prior directorships include Time Warner, Starwood, Star, Starwood Hotels and Resorts, HealthNet Incorporated, Beckton, Dickerson and Company, Johns Manville Corporation, and American West Airlines. Uh, Mr. Traub graduated from Bowdoin College and Yale Law School. In 2003, he was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws by Bowdoin College and was named Director of the Year by the National Association of Corporate Directors. 
So let's welcome Raymond Traub. So I'm going to get to ask the first question, and it's a very straightforward one. Uh, what does it mean to be a Supreme Court clerk? He's older than I am, so he can go first. All right. <laughs> well, let's speak in time. I, I, sorry. Uh, I suppose it means a great deal in different ways to different people. To me, except for each of my marriages, it was the greatest thing that happened to me in the world. <laughs> I want to make it clear that the first point. Uh, it was an opportunity to share, frankly, in a lot of glory with a bunch of uh, extremely able, cordial people from all around the country, from different backgrounds, rich and poor, diversity of color and religion, uh, who were there, who were in the beginning of the primes of their careers, primes of their lives, every one of whom I think was had intent to do well, do good, satisfy their own consciences, as well as be honest uh, to their bosses, to the judges for whom, whom they served. They had different experiences. So I would say it was just an outstanding opportunity. We uh, used to play, we did take a little time off once in a while. We played basketball on a court above the Supreme Court, so it was naturally called the highest court in the land, which we played <laughs> basketball. So I beat Bill Bradley in that respect. Mm -hmm. Overall, it was, uh, we, we worked on uh, important cases, mundane cases, complicated cases. Many times the decisions were made contrary to our recommendations. We didn't run the show, but we had important roles in making recommendations and doing research and talking out uh, with our bosses and our family. When we were there in 54, Ernie and I, each judge had two clerks, except one judge who thought he was smarter than everybody else, and he had one clerk, and the Chief Justice of the United States who had three clerks to help with the work of the office. But all in all, I'd give it a AAA ranking in my, my own personal lifetime. Well, it's an extraordinary honor for a graduating uh, law student. Uh, every federal judge in the federal system is entitled to one or more law clerks. Uh, District Court, Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court. Uh, as Ray said, at the time, uh, generally each justice had two, two, two uh, uh, law clerks. Some re require the clerks to spend two years there. Others, some require them to have a prior lower court experience. As in Ray's case, he clerked on the Second Circuit first. Uh, I was fortunate. Uh, my boss did not uh, require two years of service and did not require any uh, prior uh, uh, clerkship <coughs> experience. Uh, uh, I might just if you get involved in a trivia contest, I'll just tell you a little about the origin of clerkships. Uh, uh, there's nothing in the Constitution or the early Judiciary Acts uh, providing for clerks. Uh, it, uh, the custom of Supreme Court justices having clerks actually started in 1882. It started with a, uh, a new associate justice named Horace Gray from Massachusetts who had served on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court for many years. And he used to have law clerks when he was on the state court. So he decided that he would have uh, legal assistants who would, he would pay for them himself. And uh, they would assist him in research and writing. Uh, and he did that for about three years out of his own pocket. Uh, those three fellows were never listed as employees of the federal government uh, because they were paid privately. And it was after that, I think it was 1886, that finally the statute in Congress provided for the justices to hire law clerks and to uh, pay them. And the original salary was $1,500 a year. Uh, when Ray and I clerked, uh, the starting salary for a law clerk without prior experience was 
five thousand one hundred seventy five dollars a year which was pretty good because the starting salary at the big metropolitan law firms around the country was forty two hundred dollars in any event it was an extraordinary nowadays it's quite reversed uh, <laughs> uh, it was an extraordinary experience uh, certainly a rare experience for me because my parents were immigrants they came to this country uneducated I went through public schools in Brooklyn and when I was in the courthouse uh, in the chambers and in, in, in the court itself uh, when the Brown decisions were announced I realized this was an extraordinary thing that there I was the son of immigrants uh, and uh, I was present at what I knew even at the age of 25 was an ex historic event in the life of the country so. well before we get specifically to the Brown decision how about one of you giving us a short description about what the Supreme Court does when it agrees to take a case, uh, granting certiorari, because that's what happened in the Brown case. Well, uh, uh, the Supreme Court is not obligated to take any cases. Uh, it controls its own uh, uh, docket. And most of the cases come up on petitions for certiorari, where the uh, lawyers who have lost below <coughs> Uh, asked the court to issue a writ of certiorari to the lower court saying send up the record and uh, take the case. Uh, the overwhelming percentage of uh, petitions for certiorari, colloquial as they're called, cert petitions, are denied. A very small percentage of the, these applications are taken, very small. There is another category of case which uh, technically is an appeal. And there, it's not a petition for certiorari, it's called a, a statement of jurisdiction. Uh, there's a slight additional presumption that maybe the case is important enough to take. Most of those get denied too. Uh, and so the court uh, listens to and decides a relatively small percentage of the cases that come up through the federal court, a, a, a tiny percentage compared to the courts of appeal around the United States with an aggregate number of the lower courts decide many, many more cases. Uh, um. Can either of you tell us why are Supreme Court decisions so important? What difference do they make? And maybe each of you could give us an example of what you think, aside from Brown, what was a very profound decision that had a profound impact? Well, I, <clears throat> I think it's the, the fact that the, the, the very presence of the United States Supreme Court implies a last bastion of, if not power, uh, respect and domination, in effect. You can't, in the United States, you don't go beyond the United States Supreme Court if, in fact, they take your case. And although many opinions are convoluted, written by, in some cases, almost in an un un understandable fashion, maybe not logical, maybe they're five to four, there's a five to four vote, and you have six opinions or eight opinions, it's very difficult for lawyers to find out, and certainly for the ordinary citizenry, to know what the hell they're talking about. But the point is, it is pretty much a finality also, I think if we go back into the history of the United States, as far as I know, there's been no rebellion against the decision by the Supreme Court of the United States. You have, whether it's five to four or nine to zero, the law, the, the decision of the court is adhered to as best as public officials can understand it. Maybe people uh, <coughs> reluctantly enforce the court's edict, but it's enforced. In other countries, that is not, that is not the case. And you have, uh, I would say that some of the important cases in our lifetimes, mine is a little longer than most of yours, but you have Roe v. Wade, with which probably everybody in this room is familiar. Uh, I personally think the decision in, <clears throat> in Bush v. Gore, or Gore v. Bush, was extremely important. I believe that the United States Supreme Court elected the President of the United States. You may not agree with that, but that happens to be my view. Uh, there are other cases, uh, a number of other cases that uh, have an impact. 
uh, on the daily lives of people. For example, the, the decision in Citizens United, which meant that there was more free, free spending of election money by corporations, has an impact on all of us because they can spend more on pushing the election of an individual or a uh, or an issue than any one of us individually, except maybe for Warren Buffett. So there is a an all power, uh, an all powerful institution. I think run honestly. I, I don't believe it's corrupt. And I, while the decisions are not always to my liking or to any of your likings, it is final and arrived at honestly, in my opinion. And that is one of the, the fundamental strengths of the United States, of, the, of this democracy. If, if there's no place to go after the Supreme Court decides, with one qualification. Uh, if it's a non-constitutional decision, uh, there's always recourse to the Congress of the United States. And the losing party can go there and through the legislative process uh, get a different result. If it's a constitutional issue, uh, then uh, you have the possibility of amendment of the Constitution, immensely difficult and most unlikely to happen in the overwhelming number of cases, or in the fullness of time uh, as society changes and as the composition of the court changes, you may get a later court to revisit uh, the decision uh, and to uh, refuse to follow it, which of course is what happened in, uh, in the Brown cases. I just want you to understand, when we talk about Brown against Board of Education, there are actually five cases. Four that came up through the states, uh, uh, Delaware, uh, Virginia, Kansas, and uh, South Carolina. And the reason it's called Brown against Board of Education is when the cases were set down, numbered for the new year, uh, for the 53, 54 year, uh, the Kansas case happened to be first. And the name of that case was Brown against Board of Education. There was one opinion that covered the four state cases, and then there's a separate opinion, which most people don't even know about, called Bowling Against Sharp, which dealt with uh, school uh, segregation in the District of Columbia. And that posed a different legal issue, uh, and therefore it required a separate opinion. But the court did not have much difficulty in uh, resolving that. Uh, but it's the end of the uh, end of the line. It's uh, immensely powerful, and that's why appointments to the Supreme Court are so immensely important, particularly if it's a young judge, because you put somebody on who's 40 years old, that person could be there for 40, 50 years with a profound effect on uh, constitutional law and uh, statutory interpretation. Thanks. So now we will get specifically, we already started to get into the Brown case. Just to open it up for us, um, how did you and the judges you worked for, justices you worked for, see, what did you see as the major issues in Brown, the legal constitutional issues, but even the societal issues? Okay. Uh, It's sort of a complicated question. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. The legal issues were fairly straightforward. And if uh, cases were decided purely on precedent, uh, purely on past practice, purely on the basis of the history of this country, it would have been an easy case to uh, resolve. Uh, and the court would have upheld the doctrine of separate but equal. What is separate but equal? It came out of an 1896 case involving transportation uh, where the railroads were segregating uh, people of color and uh, the issue is whether constitutionally they could do that uh, in, in, the, in the states that followed Jim Crow. And the court held in an eight to one opinion uh, that uh, so long as the accommodations were uh, equal, they could be separate. And separate but equal became the mantra uh, for uh, Jim Crow throughout the South. The reality is it was always separate, but I assure you it was never equal. Uh, and uh, that principle was applied also to public education. Uh, 
and uh, the decision to challenge that doctrine in the area of public education was uh, one carefully taken largely by the lawyers at the then NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Fund, and, uh, but they knew the foundation had to be established. And what they did very wisely is they first attacked the notion of separate but equal on graduate and professional school education. And there were a series of cases that preceded the public school cases where the court uh, held that the practices of the state were unconstitutional because it was clear that while uh, nominally they were equal, they were not equal in any realistic sense. So the foundation was laid there. There's a whole series of cases in the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, and then came the uh, challenge of the lower courts in the different states and they work their way up to the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, my judgment, there was not one of those justices uh, thought that segregation was justified. Uh, that wasn't the issue. Uh, they knew the tremendous inequality, uh, the humiliation that people suffered on a daily basis. The problem was uh, how does the court resolve this uh, in view of the uh, precedent that has, had existed uh, not only from 1896 with separate but equal, but the practice of segregated uh, public schools beginning right after the Civil War uh, in states that had ratified the 14th Amendment. Uh, and the justices uh, who were most troubled by the case, they were not that they were in favor of school segregation, but how, where does the court derive the power from? To, to impose its will, and that was the hard part uh, of the decision, and that's what I think led to uh, uh, incredible internal discussions and a decision, because they, the justices had not reached a consensus, to have the cases re-argued a second year. Uh, the cases were argued uh, first in the fall of 1952. That was the year before Ray and I uh, clerked. And it was set down for re-argument. And uh, these five companion cases were then, uh, as I said before, were renumbered, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and put on the docket for the next year. And the second argument took place where we were there, and that was, I believe, in December of 1953. And uh, nominally, uh, they asked counsel to uh, review the legislative history of the uh, 14th Amendment. That was the focus of the request for re-argument. And they posed five, five issues for counsel to address in the re-argument. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if you'd be interested, I'll just give an example of the first one. Uh, I happen to have taken with me as a memento of the briefs in all the cases. I have <laughs> half a bookcase filled with this stuff. Uh, and this is uh, from the brief uh, in the South Carolina case. And that's important for a reason I think we'll get to later. First question, the court asked, what evidence is there that the Congress, Congress which submitted and the state legislatures and conventions which ratified the 14th Amendment contemplated or did not contemplate, understand or did not understand that it would abolish segregation in public schools. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the answer from South Carolina was the overwhelming preponderance of the evidence demonstrates that the Congress which submitted and the state legislatures which ratified the 14th Amendment did not contemplate and did not understand that it would abolish segregation of public schools. And that was the core question uh, that, that the courts had to deal with. Uh, and uh, as you know, they finally got to uh, a unanimous decision, a single opinion, which was extraordinary, in May of 1954. Uh, and that's the, so the, the legal challenge uh, to it. Uh, but what they felt in their hearts and what they knew was right, I don't, I don't think there was any question in the minds of any of the nine. It's just uh, how much judicial power can the 
can you exert in the country to tolerate in a country of laws? So. Um, Mr. Schwab, I was just wondering to follow up on that if you would like to uh, uh, discuss whether you saw in the justices any sense that they recognized that this was more than a constitutional issue, that this was a societal issue, despite the fact that they had to make the decision on the basis of the Constitution. What were they thinking, or if you know what they were thinking in their heart of hearts about the broader societal issue? I think you may. No, may yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, you know. Confused. No, I, I didn't want to cut into Ernie's uh, presentation. Sorry. Uh, none of us really knows what was in the heart or hearts of the, uh, of the court. There were nine individuals, all pretty bright, different levels of uh, ability. Uh, there, it was uh, one, when, when the decisions were when push came to shove, one of the justices was in the hospital, I think, having suffered a heart attack and weren't sure of his health. It was generally thought, although Ernie has a letter from a former law clerk, which will say something different, but it was thought that one justice who happened to come from the south state of Kentucky uh, was opposed to uh, was opposed to, preferred separate but equal, was opposed to uh, making things totally equal. Uh, and there was a third sort of on the, uh, in the middle. It was, I think, fortuitous that at the time the decision was going to be made, I, I shouldn't say it this way, but it was fortuitous that the chief, the then Chief Justice of the United States died suddenly, and uh, he, he was leaning, he was also from the South, he was leaning against uh, uh, e equality of treatment. Uh, the then President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, appointed the then or I, I, the former governor, or maybe it was the then the governor of the state of California, uh, Warren, Earl Warren, who was a more liberal than many of the other candidates for the job, who was very popular in the state of California, who had run for, I think, the vice president of the United States under, with Tom Dewey. And uh, Warren, this, I may be going beyond your question, no, no, but it's I I, 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 to me. To me, this is most important, and this is the theme of my. If I were addressing uh, so, the sole question, uh, Warren, to his credit, while he was a politician, and that's sort of a demeaning expression. Hope that nobody here is a politician, but uh, <laughs> he was a politician, but very, very popular. But it was a, and he was a fine man. Uh, he decided that this decision was so vital to the stolidity of the United States, to peace and contentment in the, in the United States, peace in the United States, that it had to be a unanimous decision. The court could not issue a 5-4 or a 6-3 or a 7-2 decision or have, or have people abstain. This had to be unanimous, so he decided to take the time to make sure the decision was in order. He, he was in favor, obviously, of, of equality of treatment. And so he visited Mr. Judge X in the hospital, and he visited Judge Y, Mr. Justice Y, in his home, and, uh, and finally and, and, and said to, to them, you know, in effect, do you want to be the one to be the sole and you go down to be your legacy to be uh, a vote against equality of treatment in the schools, equality of treatment of people, children. And uh, so he worked on that, and he, and in my view, the most important result of the, of the decision was the fact that it was a unanimous decision. It was unanimity. It was the United States Supreme Court, the last, just about the last voice in the land saying in one voice that this shall not pass, that the segregation is going to be, they couldn't enforce it immediately, 
the army wasn't at their command, so you couldn't go out into the streets immediately and make all the schools equal. But I, I feel that was the most important, and the, probably the most important contribution that Chief Justice Warren made in his lifetime. Mr. Rubenstein, uh, would you like to come? I want to elaborate on that. The death of Vincent was profoundly important. Uh, he died suddenly uh, in early September of 1953. This was after the original argument uh, and before the re-argument. Uh, he was not highly respected by many of the judges on the court, the other justices. Uh, he was affirmatively disliked by some of them. He had no effective leadership capacity to bring that court together in any harmonious way. Uh, to give you an idea how venomous some of the views were, uh, Justice Frankfurter, who was one of the important justices and did a lot of the strategizing for the handling of the case, was quoted as saying that uh, Vincent's death was the first tangible evidence he had ever seen that there was a God in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty rough stuff. Uh, uh, but uh, what happened is, uh, as legend has it, uh, in order to get Warren's support at the 1952 Republican Convention, when uh, the challenge was between Eisenhower, supported generally by the moderate and liberal Republicans, uh, opposed by Robert Taft, who was a quite conservative uh, senator from uh, Ohio, uh, that Warren, through his support, to Eisenhower, and supposedly Eisenhower uh, promised him the first seat on the Supreme Court when it opened. Supposedly, of course, he had no idea that was going to be the Chief Justice's seat, but uh, he did welch. Uh, and then uh, it's sort of an interesting footnote to history. Very soon after he died, almost a matter of days, uh, uh, President Eisenhower nominated uh, Warren to be Chief Justice. Uh, that was a recess appointment because uh, the Congress was not in session. And, uh, but uh, Warren proceeded to sit on cases immediately, even though it was a recess, uh, recess appointment. This is my former law partner, Max Gitter, uh, husband of Betsy Gitter, former professor here. Uh, we'll explain all the things we <laughs> misstated here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, according to the definitive work on the, the case, the cases, the whole subject, uh, Simple Justice, book published in 1976 by a man named Richard Kluger, uh, the court never took a vote on the case until, on the cases, until March of 1954, after the second argument, after the Senate had confirmed Warren's nomination. Uh, it was such a political case. Uh, the, whole, the eyes of the country were focused on it. And uh, the, the, the courthouse was populated by Southerners, white Southerners, uh, the clerk's office, the, the, uh, the policemen, uh, uh, the only, all the law clerks at the time were white. Uh, the only people of color were those who were uh, 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 on the custodial staff, or messengers, drivers, and the barber. There's a barber shop as well as a uh, basketball court there. There's also a parking garage in the basement. There's a print shop in the basement. The men who worked in the print shop were white Southerners. Uh, so as a result, uh, or there's a tremendous focus on a, very, a great concern about leaks. I should tell you that we are here under false pretenses <coughs> because the justices had made a pact among themselves that unless there was a, a central reason for it, they were not to discuss <coughs> the cases with the law clerks. And we were not privy to what you asked what they thought. We didn't, I didn't know what they thought. Uh, it was just gossip. A few of the <laughs> law clerks were involved. Uh, the law clerk, in the Chief Justice's office, a fellow named Earl Pollock from California, did work on the opinion with Warren. Uh, he knew about it. Uh, Justice uh, Robert Jackson, 
who had a serious heart attack in the uh, late winter, early spring of 1954, had a wonderful law clerk named Barrett Pritiman, uh, and uh, Barrett uh, went back and forth to the hospital with drafts, was researching issues. Uh, uh, Justice Reed, who allegedly was the last one to decide to vote with the court, uh, had his law clerk researching a number of issues. And one of his two law clerks uh, was a classmate of ours at law school. And he has written extensively on the subject of uh, the myth of uh, Justice Reed having held out to the end and expected to vote against it. And, uh, Warren supposedly said, do you want to be the only one to go down in history? And Jack Fassett, this classmate of mine, uh, <coughs> denies that. It never happened. Uh, but what was an extraordinary accomplishment, and I attributed this to Earl Warren, uh, was to coax them patiently and continue the dialogue and eventually get not only unanimous court, but a single opinion, and I can't tell you how extraordinary that was in view of the people who were on the court. Uh, I mean, you had some very strong characters there, and the notion that Hugo Black or uh, Robert Jackson, uh, Frankfurter would not write an opinion, concurring opinion for history, is extraordinary, and uh, could not have happened, I'm absolutely convinced, had not been for Earl Warren. And if you want another, if you get into another trivia contest, I'll give you one other tidbit. <laughs> uh, I told you it was a very serious heart attack uh, that Justice Jackson had. And by the way, he was the best writer on the court. He was brilliant and he had a lot of influence over other justices, including my boss, uh, Tom Clark, uh, who came from Texas and was a Southerner. Uh, and. Uh, we didn't know when the opinion was coming down, but the chatter among the law clerks was that it would not come down until uh, Jackson was back in the courthouse, that they would not want the opinion to come in. And we found out on the morning of Monday, May 17th, that Jackson was back the first time in about six or seven weeks. Uh, so that was our first clue. Uh, I got a second clue because my co-clerk, a fellow named Ellis McKay, from the University of Pennsylvania and Western Pennsylvania, had worked on one of the cases coming down that day, and he went down to the print shop to check on the final changes and to make sure uh, it was proofread properly. And he came back and he was shaking his head. He said, there is a pile of wrapped in brown paper in the print shop way up to here. We knew what cases were supposed to come down that day, and there was no case that could justify that print run other than the school desegregation cases. That was the second clue. Third clue was five minutes to 12 on the way into the robing room, Justice Clark went through the law clerk's room and said he'd never said it to us before uh, during the whole time we were there. I think you boys ought to be in the courtroom today. Mm. He never used to tell us. He did micromanage our work. And uh, of course, that was the extraordinary day. What was the trivia question uh, or answer? Uh, in October of that year, uh, Justice Jackson died. Mm. It was, in fact, a serious heart attack. And uh, President Eisenhower appointed as his replacement a New York, eminent New York lawyer named John Marshall Harlan. He was the grandson of the sole dissenter in the uh, Plessy against Ferguson in 1896. If you look, the one who dissented in that case was John Marshall Harlan. And it was his grandson who was appointed to the court and replaced Robert Jackson. I think I've gone a far afield, I'm sorry. No, it was great. Can I just add one, <laughs> yes. one bit of uh, trivia? Sorry to what we, we, Ernie spoke earlier, we were talking about President uh, Eisenhower appointing Earl Warren, and we described him, and I agree with it, that he was a moderate Republican, which implied some sense of some liberality. Uh, but it, it was, Ernie will recommend some books for you to read if you're really for, interested in furthering your knowledge of what, what we're talking about. And in one of the books, it is reported that Eisenhower said that his worst mistake in office was appointing Earl Warren, but he didn't <laughs> like the opinion that Earl Warren wrote. Uh, uh, President Truman, who appointed uh, 
my boss, Tom Clark, said and my, the same. And my boss, uh, Harold Burton. <laughs> Harold, uh, he uh, said of Tom Clark that it was the worst mistake he made as president, <laughs> supposedly. Uh, it's not at all clear that that was uh, accurately reported. But there's a long tradition of, of, of presidents uh, disliking uh, their appointments afterwards. Uh, probably the most famous one is Theodore Roosevelt, who appointed the great Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. to the Supreme Court. And he had, uh, Roosevelt had pending before the Supreme Court the most important case of his presidency. It was an antitrust case, uh, the, the uh, Northern Securities case, and which I think involved the steel industry. And uh, he was very concerned about how Justice Holmes, who had a long distinguished record as a state court judge in Massachusetts, how he would vote in that case. And he uh, checked and rechecked and vetted him in every conceivable and was satisfied uh, that he would vote correctly. And he appointed Holmes to the court, and guess what? Holmes voted against uh, Teddy Roosevelt's position, who, and he was outraged. And he was quoted as saying, this is a famous book by Barbara Tuckman, uh, uh, on, on uh, was it Bob Tuckman? In any event, uh, said uh, 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 Roosevelt said of, uh, of Holmes, I could carve more backbone out of the banana than that man has. <laughs> that's about one of the greatest justices in the history of the Supreme Court. <laughs> so uh, uh, you have to take rather lightly these criticisms of the, of the statements that presidents make afterwards. So. Okay, we have, um, I think I have one more question before quest we open it up to the audience. So we also wanted you to comment on the tactics and abilities of the two teams in the, um, or I guess there are more than two teams because you said there were five cases, but the broad, the NACP lawyers and the lawyers on the, for the plaintiffs and the lawyers on the well, defendant's side. Well, I'll, I'll I'll try to answer that, and I have a very interesting document in front of me on that subject. Probably the most distinguished appellate advocate in the country at the time, uh, the most distinguished uh, Supreme Court advocate was a man named John W. Davis, and his name graces one of the major New York law firms, the Davis Polk firm today, is one of the very best firms in the city. John W. Davis had run for President of the United States as a Democrat in 1924, he lost, and he was considered the outstanding appellate advocate. He was then about 80 years old, he had a full shock of white hair, and he had a deep resident voice, and he was a powerful advocate. Uh, he was, uh, there was no one better in the United States than John W. Davis, so while the five states, each one had a raft of lawyers, most of the attention was focused on John W. Davis. And when he spoke in the courtroom, everybody listened. So uh, one doesn't have to worry about the uh, four states in the District of Columbia being underrepresented. <laughs> uh, and here I'm going to add uh, an item of history, another footnote. About five years ago, I was uh, at a dinner, and I sat next to a man who was about 98 years old. Uh, and he was quite a well-known lawyer, and he was in the Davis Pope firm, and his name was Hazard Gillespie. And he had been a U.S. attorney in the Southern District, uh, which is the federal district attorney in the federal system. And we got to talking that night, and it turned out that he had been John W. Davis's principal brief writer, and uh, had a very close relationship with him. And they told me he was going to send me a letter that uh, John W. Davis wrote in the fall of 1951, a year before the first argument, uh, uh, to the widow of Joseph Proskauer. Joseph Proskauer was a very famous New York lawyer, and uh, there is a very distinguished law firm today that carries his name, the Proskauer firm. And uh, apparently, the, the Davises and the Proskauers had been very close socially. Uh, Joe Proskauer was dead by then. And his wife, Alice, Pro Alice Proskauer, uh, had written a note to John W. Davis because it had been made public that Davis was going to represent South Carolina in 
these school desegregation cases. And basically, she said to John W. Davis, how could you possibly do this? How could you possibly take this position? And on the date of October 23, 1951, he wrote her a Dear Alice letter. <laughs> uh, and I, just, I want to quote from it because it tells you how people in good faith could have ended up on the other side. Just a couple of paragraphs. Uh, the legal question is whether or not the 14th Amendment, with its equal protection of the laws clause, invalidates the Constitution and statutes of the state of California providing for separate schools for the children of the white and colored races. This is not a new question. 17 states and the District of Columbia have such provisions. The same Congress which submitted the 14th Amendment proceeded immediately to provide for separate schools in the District of Columbia. Succeeding Congresses have continued this provision to, the day, to this day and the Supreme Court has decided the question in favor of segregation directly in three cases and by implication in others. And then he went on to say, and the, 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 the courts of last resort of 21 states have held to the same effect, including New York State. Against this truly formidable array of authority, legislative and judicial, the petitioners of the present case have argued it as a question of policy and have undertaken to support their position by the testimony of some half dozen anthropologists, psychologists, and professors of education who testify that in their opinion, segregation is a bad thing and leads to bad results. To this, South Carolina answers that this argument could be properly addressed to the legislatures or constitutional conventions, but not to courts called on to interpret existing constitutional law. And so there you get a different set of spectacles through which uh, these issues were viewed. Uh, I think I'll stop there. So uh, you don't have to worry about the southern states <laughs> being well represented. They were well, well represented, represented, right? Yeah. yeah, we had actually uh, given him a longer version of that question. We said that. Um, the um, plaintiff's side were using uh, evidence-based research and had a strong team who had already argued in the Supreme Court before, and so we were wondering what the, um, what the other side had. So now you see they had the big guns. <laughs> and a lot of precedent. And a lot of, pre right, sorry, and a lot of precedent. Given the history of segregation and, uh, you know, uh, second-class citizenship up to the time of Brown, how was it possible that such a formidable legal team could be assembled by the NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Fund? Well, there were many distinguished black lawyers. Uh, you know, there were uh, Howard Law School, which had been an historically black college and law school, it turned out some wonderful lawyers. Uh, other schools in the north around the country admitted uh, black law, st uh, law students. Uh, I mean, did Yale at the time you were at Yale? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, way back, even, even admitted women, uh, I've got to tell you. <laughs> the first women uh, were admitted to the Air Law School around 1920, 21. Believe it or not, the first women admitted to Harvard Law School it was about 1951, something like that. There were vast differences. So there were any number of able black lawyers uh, around the country, and there were many white lawyers who worked with them. Uh, uh, notably, Jack Greenberg, uh, who had worked as, uh, as Thurgood Marshall's assistant, uh, was a very distinguished constitutional uh, lawyer. And they, in working on these cases, they had the help of some really bright talent. And I'm happy to say that there were two associates from the law firm that Max Gitter and I uh, later worked at uh, who worked on those cases. Uh, uh, one was William T. Coleman, Jr., who was a black lawyer, who was the first black member of the Harvard Law Review, had a Third Circuit clerkship, had the Supreme Court clerkship with uh, uh, Justice Frankfurter, uh, and then couldn't get a job. At any, he was from Philadelphia and could not get a job with any white law firm. Uh, nor in New York City, except for one firm, and that's the same firm, 
and then a fellow named Lou Pollock, later became dean of the Yale Law School and dean of the Pennsylvania Law School, a young associate at the firm, also worked with Thurgood Marshall and Jack Greenberg. So they had access to plenty of legal talent. That was not the problem. Could add, could add also, I think that there was a lot of representation from the great law schools, the faculty of the great law schools, in addition to the lawyers, uh, volunteered their services. They weren't being paid, but this was a t an issue that was so important to them that they uh, <coughs> offered and were used as research, uh, to research, to uh, write speeches, to uh, generally help brief the cases. In fact, Jack Greenberg, of whom Ernie spoke, uh, was someone I knew very well, and this was his, his goal, was to stay with the NAACP and be a, a lawyer, and he ultimately he I think he replaced Thurgood Marshall as a chief counsel. So, so it, wasn't, it wasn't an issue of color, is what is my point. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adrian Hobson. And uh, my question is, were, were any of the judges or just clerks of the court, were they threatened to put violence to uh, judge in favor of segregation? I'm not sure I got the question. Uh, did, were, they, were there any threats, like, to violently throw a technique if they didn't rule in favor of segregation? Well, the, I mean, the, there were no threats that I, I'm aware of. Uh, if there were any, I certainly didn't know about them. The law clerks generally were uh, liberal uh, and overwhelmingly uh, uh, felt that, that uh, Plessy should be overruled. Uh, not unanimous. There were a couple of them who were Southerners, and they grew up in segregated societies. Uh, so it was uh, not uh, unanimous by any means. The most notable one who was opposed to overruling Plessy was uh, just one of Justice Jackson's two law clerks the prior year. And uh, he wrote a, a memorandum, a famous memorandum, about 11 or 12 pages, <laughs> in which he uh, argued that Plessy should not be overruled and the court should uphold compulsory school desegregation. Uh, that fellow's name was William Rehnquist. He later ended up on the Supreme Court and then he was later elevated to the Chief Justice's position. Uh, he had confirmation hearings in response to both appointments. And I have no doubt in my mind, in my opinion, that he lied at both of those hearings. Uh, that he claimed that he was just drafting what would amount to an opinion if Jackson decided that this would exceed judicial powers and that he could not overrule Plessy. Well, most people who knew anything about Justice Jackson scoffed at that. Justice Jackson was the best writer on the Supreme Court. And if you read any of his opinions, they just sparkle. Uh, and the notion that Robert Jackson would need this young law clerk, however bright, to, to write this opinion from is simply preposterous. Uh, and uh, there was never a smoking gun to show that Rehnquist uh, found, to show that Rehnquist uh, had not been truthful. Uh, but there are many people, including Richard Kluger, who wrote a 50th anniversary version, updated version of his classic book, Simple Justice, had extensive footnotes uh, on the Rehnquist story, and there's no doubt that Kluger felt that he wasn't telling the truth. Uh, or how have you seen it change? In some ways, I would argue that our schools are much more segregated 
and our students are treated like prisoners um, going through metal detectors every single day. Um, and they have to teach, um, take a standardized test um, that they never understand, right, and, and they don't know. And in some ways, kids are, I mean, we've created this invisible cloak in our society that, oh, look, segregation has been solved. And we see kids who go to black and Latino high schools and as teachers, um, especially as a teacher of color, um, a lot of the times I can relate to my students, but, um, and I guess just a little to teach in the same high school, that um, most of our staff um, and most of our teachers and principal are white teachers who don't understand the dynamic of our, uh, of our struggles and our culture. And so I'm wondering whether or not you would agree that we've created an invisible book on how education has changed for black and Latinos. There was no, more, no one more upset about the weaknesses of the public school system than I am. When I went through the public school system, it was really first rate. Uh, it is not anymore, and it's not just New York, it's around the country. And what it is is a reflection, I think, of the unwillingness of our society to invest the resources necessary to improve it. Uh, the difference, uh, the, the Brown opinion did nothing other than say, you can't impose segregation based on color. That's all it did. It didn't deal with any other issues of, uh, uh, of racism in, uh, and the pervasiveness of Jim Crow. Uh, a lot, all of that stuff that came later, uh, this opened the door, but the fight for civil rights came afterwards. Uh, uh, I have another letter here, so happens, written to President Obama shortly after he was elected, and it was written by a man named Mike McDonald, who's a very distinguished lawyer, and uh, uh, he's a longtime general counsel of the Mount Sinai Medical Center. Uh, and uh, he wrote Obama to tell him about his own experience as a law clerk in the aftermath of Brown for a very well-known judge, Frank Johnson, in Alabama. And that's where the battles were fought afterwards. And uh, it was case by case, issue by issue. Uh, and he wrote, uh, uh, after Brown, numerous landmark decisions followed over the next decades. Judge Johnson's decisions, he's writing to the president now, uh, declared unconstitutional, segregated bus counters, Alabama's poll tax, Alabama's segregated juries, prisons, libraries, parks, swimming pools, as well as the state police. Uh, Brown against Board of Education had nothing to do with that. Uh, it just dealt with a basic principle that was applicable to public schools, and that was the only issue that was before the court. The, the, uh, what has happened to the public school systems afterwards uh, is attributable to lots of things. Uh, pervasiveness of poverty, the rise of crime, the rise of uh, drugs, <clears throat> the increase in, uh, I must say, in, in the number of non-marital children, where you have 71% of births the minority communities where you don't have stable families. All of these things contribute uh, to it. It's no one thing. And a good part of the uh, segregation in the schools is attributable to one uh, the failure to put the resources in to make them effective as learning centers. Also, white flight. Uh, you can't compel people to stay in the center, uh, center cities. and. Uh, uh, the failure, I will tell you, of uh, public schools to attract the best and the brightest out of the colleges into teaching. Uh, a lot of law partners whose kids are doctors, lawyers, uh, investment bankers, all sorts of things, but they're not in the public schools. They don't go into teaching. It's not honored in this country the way it is in Finland, in South Korea, in Japan. Uh, where you don't go into public teaching, public school teaching, unless you're in the top 10% of your graduating class. Uh, in the United States, uh, teaching doesn't have the same status. So it's lots of things. Uh, and, and I don't believe there's any magic bullet to, 
to a part of it is also of course due to residential self segregation because people tend to cluster in the same areas so i don't i think it has to be fixed in time but you have to have a society that's willing to put the resources in i was wondering as a high school teacher if there are any resources you can point me to i'm going to to teach plessy and could teach Robbie board i didn't know if you guys had any books or anything that you would i've got a reading list with four wonderful books i'll give you afterwards oh, wonderful. thank you uh, and we'll post that. And, and simple justice is on that list. I would but there like are others to, too. Uh, having spoken with Ernie earlier, I, I think there's one book that I highly recommend that I don't believe is on his list. If you want a a, a very a very opinionated, very well researched, and a very interesting written book about the court at the time we were there, say the 20 year we weren't there 20 years, but in the period around 20s within. It's called the score. It's called Scorpions by Professor Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School, and it's something that I have read now two or three times to prepare for the, these types of meetings. But it's about four of the most, maybe the most able and perhaps the most controversial justices of the nine who were there, and that is Professor, I mean, Justice Franklin, uh, Justice Jackson, uh, Justice Douglas. And I forgot who the Black, Justice Black. And Justice Black. And it's a, it's a magnificent book. It's a great history. Uh, and I think it'll keep you captivated if you're really interested in this. So for, I would add it to the list that I don't believe is on it. Four of the brightest and most prickly. That's exactly. The scorpion. And, and, and precisely. That's, that's the title. And the idea scorpion, does go right. back that not one of those uh, wrote a separate opinion in the Brown it's case is extraordinary. To be able to keep them under control and uh, that was a miracle that was perfect i wanted to know both of your opinions once the decision was handed down a uh, unanimous decision did you think that the uh, desegregation would occur right away uh maybe like the next five years or 10 years after you when you had the uh, civil rights act Occurred, not just 64 but 65. When did you both believe that this would uh, come about? I uh, personally, I didn't think it would. The, the the order in one of the opinions was they should uh, work with all deliberate speed, and uh, knowing how governments in the United States work, uh, the lassitude of the officials, a lot of people <laughs> oppose the decision, as you would suspect. I think not only in the South, but in the North. So I personally didn't expect it to uh, be immediate at all, but I also didn't expect it would take as long as it's done to accomplish what someone says, as little as it's done. But So I, I just expected to move like molasses, but sort of molasses going uphill in the right direction. The, 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 the Brown opinion did not deal at all with the remedy. What the court did was set the case down for argument the following year on the issue of remedy. How do you enforce this moral principle and legal principle which has just been established? And why did they do that? Uh, I think they did it because there was no agreement among the nine over how to implement it. There were several different views and approaches. And if they had gotten into implementation, it would have undermined I think the moral force of the opinion. And by putting off the issue of enforcement, it gave the country a chance to adjust. It gave school districts a chance to figure out uh, what to do, uh, how, to, how to approach it. Some had very positive reactions. Uh, some were super negative, like South Carolina and Virginia. Uh, but it, it bought time. It, it was to preserve the, the, the uh, moral force of the opinion that they wanted to keep that unanimity. Following year, uh, uh, when they got to it, uh, they basically shipped it back to the district courts, knowing that communities differed, uh, they get different reactions among the public, uh, and uh, uh, they punted, in effect. They, everybody, by that time, they knew that, you know, the South was up in arms, some states worse than others. Uh, and they knew it was going to be a tough road. Uh, but this was the best they could do under the circumstances. And these were human beings trying to do their best. Um, I want to ask you guys, 
a rather simple question, but it's kind of deep, so I'm going to ask in parts. Um, was the gallery of the court at the time of this case integrated? And if so, was it to uphold the standard of like for free, in a sense? Um, or, and if it wasn't, was it so naturally like people automatically sat in different places? Or was no. this the implementation of the court? There, there was no segregated seating in the, in the courthouse. Uh, and in fact, I, I was standing in an alcove listening, and there was a black reporter standing right next to me as the opinion was read. But uh, uh, the segregation was pervasive uh, in the District of Columbia. And guess who instituted Jim Crow after the Civil War? Uh, because Jim Crow had disappeared, obviously, and then slowly was uh, reinstated. Uh, the president who uh, reinstated Jim Crow in the United States was none other than the great liberal uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was an arch segregationist from Western Virginia, not well known to the public at large that this was the case. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, drove me crazy when I first uh, found this out is uh, when I was visiting the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, and there was a pamphlet on the dedication ceremony in 1922, I think, and Warren Harding was president. Seating was segregated, and one of the principal speakers was the black president of Tuskegee Institute, and he had to sit in the segregated until it was time to speak. He was not allowed to sit in the That's how pervasive it was. And I give you all sorts of anecdotes about what it was like at that time, which simply accentuated the difficulty of the case. Uh, and I, just one I have to add, uh, around February of the year we were clerking, I found on my desk one day a report from the marshal's office. The marshal took care of the housekeeping of the court, the security and so forth, uh, budgeting, and uh, proposed in this report to the justices the budget for the next year. And he wanted to hire a, uh, another security officer, he wanted to hire somebody else for the office of the clerk of the court as opposed to the law clerks uh, for the justices. And uh, it read, and uh, one colored man. And I did a double take when I read that, one colored man. And I realized that this was a job category. This was in the Supreme Court of the United States in February of 1954. That's the environment that the court was dealing with. And it knew full well what an extraordinarily difficult issue it was doing and what the impact would be on a major part of the country. Do you think that that, um, do you think that, that uh, had uh, more of an influence or more just add attention to the situation in the case? I don't know what the that is. You no, know, the, it, the state, the atmosphere that you just well, the, the, the justices knew the implications of it, and they knew it was a very difficult issue. It was going to produce tremendous resentment and opposition, as it did. Uh, what happened in many states was probably predictable. Some of it, maybe not, excessive. You know, in 1957, when President Eisenhower had to send the 101st Airborne Division with bayonets into Little Rock to get a few kids into the high school, I'm not sure many people would have predicted that, that a governor would be so irresponsible as to produce the need for that. You know, so. okay. well, tough times. Here. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kwame Pemberton. Um, I'm an alumni of uh, John Jay. Uh, ironically, I wrote my senior thesis on the Brown versus Board case. Uh, I argue that the Brown versus Board decision was actually a compromised decision by the NAACP, the pro-segregationists, and the justices. And, and you know, I argue that the NAACP, you know, I, I think to answer this, this gentleman question, the first gentleman that asked the question of why did the NAACP uh, kind of represent the black people? I don't know if that was the exact question, but I found out that they were actually, um, funded by white liberals. So, and the kickback was for them to have, for the black people to be actually able to vote at a later on year. So um, you, you could actually research that if you like. 
Um, my question to you is, uh, in 1954, when the decision was handed down, uh, prior to that, the NAACP, they actually, the dual, the dual school system, uh, when they argued that, the, uh, the dual school system method was working. Why did they uh, left that method and argue for integration? And why didn't they argue for reparation? <clears throat> well, if you think that the black school system was working in the South, you were probably in a minority. It was clearly a, no. a uh, very negative compared to the white schools in, in the uh, level of teaching and the facilities. There was no comparison. Well, so, uh, I, well, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, I, the, I question well, your premise. No, I, I argue the dual, the dual school system because if, if the NWC was to argue for reparation and they received the compensation, then those school systems would, the black school system would, uh, they would have adequate funding and adequate resources equal to the whites. Well, it's now 60 years later, and what has happened to the argument about reparations? I mean, that hasn't gone any place and isn't going any place, and it surely would not have gone any place in 1954. Did you know the decision of the justices you were working for before it was announced publicly? If so, how did it feel to have knowledge of the possible outcome before it occurred? I, well, I, I knew from the day I started working how Justice Clark would vote, and uh, that was told to me by the outgoing law clerk, who I knew well from law school, who he basically told me that his their best guess, based on what they knew, was that the court, this is June of 53 now, well before the re-argument, that the court would hold it unconstitutional uh, by at least six to three. He said maybe more, he didn't know, but at least 63. Uh, Justice Clark, whose grandfather was a Confederate officer who was killed in the Civil War, whose family roots in Texas went all the way back uh, for generations, uh, had a consistent voting record in black-white cases, always in, in, in favor of racial justice. And he, coming from Texas, wrote one of the opinions holding unconstitutional the white primary, the so-called Jaybird primary in Texas, which basically decided who was going to be elected, because once that primary, and uh, he wrote an opinion which held it unconstitutional and opened up the Democratic primary to, to black voters. Um, so there was no question about uh, Justice, uh, Justice Clark and about Burton. Uh, yeah, I, my, my uh, Justice, uh, who was Hal Burton, uh, adhered to the agreement among the justices that is not to be discussed in the office with the clerks. But I knew the, how he had voted because my fellow law clerk was a holdover for the prior year. So he sort of knew what was happening and told me in, in gossip what, what the vote was, but not, uh, we didn't discuss it in a, in a rationale, the rationale of it. And your follow-up. Okay. Um, I can take a look at the audience before you. How does it feel to have at least even a spark of influence that changed history to, uh, to make John Jay the diverse school that it is today? <laughs> Well, I never felt that I changed history in any way. I was a, I was a 25 year old kid uh, as a law clerk uh, whose justice never discussed the case with him. In fact, I discussed it once on my, when my clerkship was over. It was the second week of June of 53. I was driving back to New York in my by then beat up 1950 Chevy, and Justice Clark was going to New York, and I gave him a lift. And uh, that was the first time we ever discussed. <coughs> the issue, <clears throat> excuse me, of school desegregation. And the only thing he opined at that, and we had a bite together at a Howard Johnson's, I think, uh, he said he thought in retrospect it was a mistake not to involve the law clerks, because he thought that if the law clerks uh, had had a chance, all 18 of them, to look at the opinion in draft form, uh, maybe there would have been some useful suggestions that could have strengthened the opinion and perhaps made it uh, less vulnerable to criticism uh, on the part of the uh, critics, 
uh, notably footnote what, 10 or 11, which had all of the sociological stuff in it. Uh, well, that was the only time we discussed it, so I, I, I didn't have any influence on anything. <laughs> well, I, I feel that I was, uh, as Ernie was, on the fringe of history in any event, the very limited fringe. But I, I want to say, uh, if this is the end, that I'm very proud to be asked here at, to uh, John Jay. It's a, we've done it similar uh, seminars a couple of times. The interest of the students is, seems to be intense. I like questions that are tough. Sometimes you don't answer them properly or don't answer them well. But I want to just say to you that I'm, uh, and I think Ernie would say the same thing, that we're very proud to be here and discuss something of the utmost importance. I think this is a, one of the great, one of the most important cases in the history of the Supreme Court. It's been in our lifetime. And uh, I think that overall it showed what the American people were made of and will continue to be made of. So I'm very happy to have been a part of what I was and a part of this, what this, this group and this audience. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, since my colleague, Dr. Gordon Emhart, introduced our speakers, I'll take the opportunity to extend my personal thanks to their willingness to come and share their experiences and their insights and their expertise with us. And uh, just to follow up on the question that was just asked, as somebody who's only been at John Jay three years, uh, I am excited and proud to look out and see this wonderful United Nations looking audience. It's, it really makes me proud to be not just an American, but a New Yorker. <laughs>